All right. It is an absolute incredible honor to be able to introduce Dr. Sharon Cushing for our Grand Rounds today. Um, when I have like an 18-month-old toddling around in my you know, clinic room and the family says, I think he has a balance disorder. Well, I have a problem telling a difference between the balance disorder and him being an 18-month-old. But I tell the family, I know exactly who can tell the difference. Um, Dr. Sharon Cushing is a full-time pediatric uh, motolaryngologist and the director of the CI program at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, she's a full professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, head of neck surgery at the University of Toronto, Canada. Um, she has a clinical research and surgical interest in disorders of the ear, including hearing loss and vestibular dysfunction. Um, she is by far, no question, the most preeminent internationally renowned expert in balance disorders in children. Um, she's authored more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, edited three books, authored more than 30 chapters, um, numerous grants that she's involved with, um, leadership positions on, in major um, societies, including ASPO and Centac. Um, she's been an invited keynote speaker on the topic in numerous countries, including Chile, UK, Ireland, and others. In fact, I have asked her to be um, her plus one, and she said no. Um, <laughs> she's earned numerous awards for her collaboration and work in pediatric otology. She is legit. Um, even with all these accolades and all the achievements that she's had, what really honestly sets her apart is how I know her. She um, you know, is so different from any other higher achiever, and then she's incredibly humble, and kind and down to earth. Um, when I asked her to send me her CV, uh, so I have you know some additional information to introduce her beyond what I what I know of her, which is you know a, a lot. Um, she sent me this hundred pages of her resume, highlighting you know so many achievements. And in the email, she said, "Feel free to make it short and sweet." Well, Sharon, I I promise you, I will make it as long as gl and glowing as possible. <laughs> um, plus, I love the way she says a. Eh? <laughs> um, Sharon, I'm super excited to hear what you have to say in your talk today. And with that, I'll let you go. Excellent. Thank you guys very much for having me. It's a treat to be able to join you for breakfast. So grab your coffee and your breakfast. And um, for those of you who are still in the car, um, you know, I'll, I'm enjoying being able to help you with your commute to work. So let me put my slides up and thank you for very much for the kind invitation. Um, Dr. Ane is an incredible clinician and researcher, and more importantly to me, she's a good friend. Um, and so it's a real joy to join you and um, her team today. Um, so I got to meet some of your incredible team um, when I was down at the ABS Society um, and, you know, where it's a bunch of really like-minded individuals, you know, talking about vestibular and balance function in children. So um, I'm going to speak today a little bit about how we identify these children and some of the like nitty gritty, uh, but I'm also going to put it in the context of um, why it's important. Um, so because you already have have clinicians who are amazing at testing children and doing that. But sometimes I think what can be missing is the, like, why should we put that effort in and why is it important, particularly in our kids who have um, sensory neural hearing loss? And can you hear me and see my slides okay? Okay, perfect. So a few disclosures. We also have an amazing team here in Toronto and it brings me joy to come to work today. And um, I get the same sense um, of your team that again, there's a real uh, sense of collaboration and friendship that just makes um, you know doing what you do so much more fun. I have some learning objectives, but that's the boring stuff. So let's get right to it. Um, and this slide really represents what we're gonna talk about today in the sense that we are privileged to look after children and to play a role in how they develop their brains. That feels pretty heavy. Um, it's a pretty huge responsibility um, to think about the fact that what we do and what we don't do and what we figure out about them and what we don't figure out about them is actually going to change how they develop their brain. And so that's the context that we're going to think about um, in our kids who have um, vestibular loss or dysfunction um, in that if we don't identify it, or if we don't treat it, and the same goes for their hearing, they're going to have an altered trajectory. 
So let's get right down to the impetus of this talk, which is, you know, why care about it? And I think, you know, we certainly probably the biggest population of individuals who show up in our offices with vestibular dysfunction are those who also have sensory neural hearing loss. They come to us as audiologists and as clinicians who care for children with hearing loss uh, first. And we know that the overlap between vestibular dysfunction and hearing loss is super large. Um, and so it depends on the study that you look at and which population you're looking at, but it can be as high as 70%. That was a CI population. In our uh, study here at SickKids, it was 35 to 40 percent. Again, a, a population of children with severe to profound hearing loss, and so likely a higher prevalence than all comers with hearing loss. But by far and away, vestibular impairment is the single most common associated feature of sensory neural hearing loss. And so as clinicians, we talk about should we order an EKG or um, a renal ultrasound and, and all of that for things that are important, but about one percent of all the kids with hearing loss, whereas many times we don't do vestibular testing or even a balanced screen because it's tough. And so that's where, again, increases in skill as well as increase in the knowledge of why it's important um, can really lead us to, um, to take better care of these children. So if we look at other data and try and sort of back up from that population of children who are going to get in cochlear implants, so severe to profound hearing loss, and think about all comers, we can look at the prevalence of vestibular impairments in children with hearing loss, period, um, as being about just under 15%. So it's still huge, even if we take all the children who come in with mild or moderate hearing loss. And this is some data out of Belgium, and they do really beautiful studies. So anytime you're looking for, for great data, um, they probably have some of the best data in the world. Now, how do we assess function. And so I'm going to go right into this and we can do it clinically in the in the clinic. So this is a little boy who had meningitis and we're doing a head thrust test. You know, you can park them on their parents' lap and you can see he doesn't really mind me turning his head from side to side. He's not crying or screaming his head off. You need to give them something fun to look at. But watch as we go to the left. See that huge saccade back? What we see in that moment is that this child has peripheral vestibular dysfunction function. And so it can be a clinical diagnosis. You don't necessarily need to have anything fancy um, from an equipment perspective. You just have to have some experience. And ultimately, that experience will buy confidence in terms of knowing that you're going to recognize some dysfunction. Now, there are lots of different ways to test canals. And so the nice thing is that we've developed, not we, but the, there has been developed all kinds of technology to assist us in this, to give us more objective testing, uh, much in the way that we do on the hearing side of things. So here we have a young girl with goggles on. So let's see what that looks like. So again, here's a little guy who had um, a posterior fossa tumor. Um, and, you know, clearly that kind of surgery can have huge impacts on balance. But he also received cisplatin, which we know does loves the inner ear. Um, and so we were trying to see if in addition to his central dysfunction, he also had peripheral vestibular dysfunction. We're calibrating these goggles. So I'm holding his head because kids move their head um, a lot. And he doesn't mind wearing the goggles. He wears swim goggles. They're Captain America. America goggles. And of course, I turn away and he takes them off, right? And, and for those of you who test children regularly, you know that that's the reality of testing. And so here we're doing the head thrust test and his mom is smirking in the background because literally every time you see me moving my hands, every time I move his head, he's saying, ow, ow, ow. And he's got this huge scar from his posterior fossa um, surgery. And I worry that I'm hurting him. And this proves the value of having a couple of testers, right? Um, and here I am sort of doing it by myself. Um, and, and that's an important aspect as well. Um, because when I first started, we didn't have clinical expertise. We didn't have um, funding for an audiologist to do this testing. So when I started in practice, I did all the testing myself. And it speaks to the idea of start somewhere. Start with what you can. You don't have to have a perfect system. Now, there's all kinds of different systems, and this is a goggle-free system, which we really love. It's called the Synapsis. It is not yet FDA-approved, 
approved, or at least last I heard, it's been Health Canada approved for a long time because it's a French system. Um, and what's nice about it is that you don't have to futz with the goggles um, and all of that. And I always thought that maybe it wasn't as good as putting goggles on. Like the harder it is, the better it should be, is sort of the the adage. But um, Kristen Yankee from Omaha recently tested it versus a goggle-based system, um, and it's just as good. So, so we do have these tools in the clinic, but it's, you don't have to have them to get started. This is a little guy. I'm going to show you lots of videos today um, as we go through the how to test. And this is a little guy with cochlear implants. You can see I keep knocking them off. Um, cochlear implants are in the wrong place for head thrust testing. Um, and he had come and he knocked out his, his um, magnet on both sides, each on one occasion. And so he's sitting NPO. I'm waiting to take him to the OR. And we thought, okay, let's bring him upstairs because is this kid falling more because of his vestibular dysfunction? And indeed, this boy did have vestibular dysfunction and we were able to get some good objective testing and we'll talk a little bit more about um, that potential risk to uh, the human and the implants um, as we move through but this can be really helpful testing to do and it is feasible in children. The um, we now have two audiologists. Um, Melissa is one of our audiologists who started off. Um, she's pictured in this, um, this these photos, and she started off as a clinical audiologist and got so interested in vestibular function that she decided to do her PhD. So she's in the third year of her PhD, and it and it speaks to again. Um, you know, there's all kinds of talent uh, within our clinical teams. And, you know, because we're a clinical and a research program at times, um, there's an inspiration to um, move towards doing a more research-based practice. And that's certainly what's happened to Melissa. And we're so grateful she was willing to take that leap of faith. But this is the synapsis system and, uh, and the way it's set up. Again, we have a high chair, we have a booster seat, and we often have a parent. The final, um, the final way that we can test the horizontal canal is kind of cool. It takes um, uh, advantage of the fact that children who are very young, under six months, can't suppress their VOR. So this is my son at three months of age, and this is the mom-powered rotary chair, okay? And so because he can't suppress his VOR, we don't need to put goggles on. And look at that. Is that not the most beautiful post-rotary nystagmus you have ever seen in your life? Um, it is gorgeous. So in this moment, we can say that this child's um, horizontal canal system is intact. We can spin them the other way, make sure it works that way. But this is super useful for our kids who come in that we're evaluating for sensory neural hearing loss, right? Get them in a chair, spin them. And in that moment, you can say, yep, the system is working because we're not looking for subtle weaknesses or abnormalities. We're looking for barn door obvious bilateral loss. And so this test can pick it up. There are other parts to the system other than the canals, although the horizontal canals get a lot of the credit and, and attention. We also have the otolithic system. And so here's some examples of how you can do that in a young child. She's not enjoying it. Let's be real <laughs> here. Um, but essentially, you can have them sit on the parent's lap and turn their head. Um, we try and get all the electrodes on at once so that we can do CVAMP and OVAMP. We typically will um, use a bone conduction stimulus, and then we can overcome any middle ear fluid and then we give them something interesting to look at so you can see the iPhone coming in here with the second tester um, so that they can generate that muscle contraction. So that is testing in a nutshell. And as I said, you've got a lot of expertise in your clinical group already. Um, so we're going to move on to a few other things, um, including the output of the system. And so just like it's important to measure speech recognition and speech testing scores, it's important to measure the output of the vestibular system. And we do that in the form of balance testing. We chose this test many moons ago, one, because it was feasible for me as a surgeon to do in my clinic. Our audiologists do this now because we don't have a physical therapist who works with us and they also love it it's a great extension of their practice um um, and it gets them at times out of the audio booth, which, uh, which again, they enjoy. So let me show you what this looks like. So it's a nine item task. And um, this is, um, we have two boys doing it and they're matched for age, gender and t-shirt color. And you can see they have very, very different 
balance skills. So the little boy that's on the right hand side of your screen doesn't need my help. You don't see me pictured in that frame. Whereas the little boy on the left hand side of the screen is really struggling. You almost think he's putting on. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it it shows you that he really is, you know, moving quite, um, quite a bit and his head's moving around. Um, and he really can't do what the young boy uh, can do. And I don't know if you can read it, but look on, look at his shirt. It says surf tour. Um, you think this kid's going to get up on a surfboard? I don't think so. Not with this vestibular impairment. And he has type one ushers. So he has bilateral implants. He has um, bilateral hearing loss, bilateral vestibular impairment, and ultimately he's going to lose his vision. And so this navigating the world is going to be super tough for this child. And so when we look at our kids with um, severe to profound hearing loss, this is what we see in terms of their balance tests. And these are normal hearing children. So the mean, um, we did a, a, a normal, uh, a typical group um, of our own, but the mean is about 15 on this, which is age standardized, which is nice. So you can compare a child over time and you can compare ch children of different ages. This was our group of all comers with hearing loss, most of whom had cochlear implants. Um, so severe to profound in terms of their phenotype, um, but some of them had vestibular impairment and some of them didn't. And they were an order of magnitude worse than the children with typical hearing. Now, these are our kids like the one that you just saw who had bilateral vestibular impairment and what's important here is that they tend to plateau at the balance age of a four and a half year old and that's why we they fool us right because four and a half year olds they can do a lot they can run they can jump um, they typically can't stand on one foot for very long um, uh, sorry they they um, they typically can stand on one foot and we'll talk about that um, uh, but they probably can't ride a bike without trainers. And so um, so that's one of the groups that we're really um, going to look at as we go through the why is it important component of this talk. So lots of kids with hearing loss come into our clinic. And so uh, how do we test them all? And some of it is, um, even though practically I'd love for every child to be tested, even though we care a lot about vestibular function here, we just can't do it. Um, and so it's important to strategize in terms of who you're gonna test. The children who are in this red box um, are at high risk. So any of our kids with cochleal vestibular anomalies. Um, and then in the yellow box, we've got CMV and ANSD and I've put them in yellow because they're a little bit different. They will have partial um, dysfunction in the periphery, uh, but they look like kids with bilateral vestibular loss, like the one that I showed you. And that's probably because there's a central component. Again, our ANSD kids, um, with the exception of, uh, you know, otoferlin, I'm thinking of the kids who have significant um, NICU risk factors, for example. Um, they are very high risk of having some degree of vestibular impairment. Our kids with recessive genetic causes of hearing loss like connects and mutations typically are fine unless we do them harm um, by putting in cochlear implants but we'll talk about that as well and mitochondrial and autoimmune I never really believe that they should be in this category um, but our small sample size suggests that they should be but that it may be a sample size issue now, when we think about, I mentioned otoferlin, um, and I think it's relevant to think about vestibular function as we start to enter this era of gene therapy. Kids with otoferlin have normal vestibular function, um, at least before we do anything to them, but I think it's going to become even more important to measure it because we can see gene therapies like implants as a potential insult to, co uh, to vestibular function, but we can also see them as a potential solution in a way that cochlear implants may not be. And so I think measuring baseline function as the list of diseases or um, mutations that we treat with gene therapy increases is going to be all the more important. So let's focus on one of these entities, and that's going to be CMV, um, which is a super important and hot topic. Um, but it very, um, it's probably one of the ones that is the most important when it comes to vestibular loss. And so we know that CMV does a number on the cochlea. So these pictures here, this is the stria vascularis. So these are electron micrographs done in one of our labs of Albert Park's um, mouse model of CMV. And so this is like this top one is art. You could put this on your wall. It is so gorgeous. And this is what happens to that stria vascularis um, when it is subjected to a model of congenital CMV. It's a shadow of its former self. And that explains the high prevalence 
incidence of hearing loss in our kids with CMV. Now, CMV loves the vestibular system probably even more than the hearing system. And so, again, we can see um, deposits of CMV on the crista ampullaris. And when we look at the prevalence of vestibular dysfunction in these kids, it's super high. It's at least 50%. Although these studies are biased by the fact that they often studied kids who were highly affected by CMV, not our kids who have, quote unquote, just hearing loss. There are some other studies, again, out of Belgium, this group's amazing, where they looked at about 170 kids, most of whom were asymptomatic CMV. Um, and again, their prevalence was just about 15%, but you'll notice it's actually higher than sensory neural hearing loss. So these kids are ones that can come in primarily with vestibular impairment. So... The importance, um, this slide is a, is a one-off, but sometimes children will present with episodic vertigo and sensory neural hearing loss, and people will straight away go to Meniere's just because that's what we think of in the adult population. But by far and away, those are kids with either congenital CMV, um, cochlear vestibular anomalies like our kids with EVA and Pendred or functional neurologic disorder. And so we see a lot of those kids and that could be a whole other topic. Um, but typically these kids are not Meniere's. It's super, super uncommon. So you want to go looking for these other things through imaging and testing. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the how and the whom, and now let's finish by talking about the why. Um, and so our journey um, in terms of wanting to learn about vestibular function really started when we started to do bilateral vestibular implants in the early 2000s. I was a student in the lab in the middle of my residency um, doing a master's degree, and so that became part of the um, topic of my master's thesis because we were very worried that by putting an implant plants, we were going to destroy the vestibular system and render these children unable to function from a motor perspective. Now, we know that vestibular implants can be bad for the vestibular system, um, and particularly um, at times where we weren't doing soft surgery or we were consistently putting it into this um, scale of vestibuli. Um, you know, we could see fibrosis, we could see distortion, and we could see loss of the electrophysiologic potentials. And so, there's no doubt that shoving an implant as gently as we do it into the inner ear um, can be bad, but we learned so much more um, than what we set out to find. And that's the part, of, the second part of this lecture that I'll share with you today. So this is the, there's always a video. <laughs> um, and so this is our little guy with ushers, right? And we're at our cochlear implant skating party, um, which we do annually. And here he's like going around and I'm recording this thinking like, how amazing is this? This kid's got no vestibular system and he's up on skates and he's put a ton of practice in, but this is amazing. And then that happens. And I'm sure many of you in the audience cringed. I still do, even though I've watched this video a hundred times. And he took it on the chin. His arms did not go out. He did not have a fall response because he's never learned to fall. Um, those are the things that we tend you know, to take for granted. And we had an aha moment because this child has also had two cochlear implant failures. And so we went back and we looked at some old data that we had previously published. We had published on our failure rate and one of the things that we had noticed was that there were lots of kids with meningitis, like more than the average or what we would expect given the prevalence in our population. We made something up theoretically like ossification and maybe meningitis is hard on the implant and yada, yada, yada. We were totally wrong. Um, and we went back and we looked at that data because we had this parallel um, group of kids in whom we had tested um, balance function and vestibular function. And so we went back and we looked at it. And so this is that BOT data, that balance test data, and we've got our standardized norms with a mean of around 15. These are groups of kids who had not been re-implanted. So they looked a lot like all comers. And these were our kids who had been re-implanted, so significantly poorer. Now, many people will say, oh, well, but you've been in their ear a couple times. Like, I'm sure you're gentle, but <laughs> how gentle can you be? Um, and the truth is, is a lot of this data was actually collected prior to their re-implant because of the parallel nature of this. We also looked at their vestibular function. And so we had caloric data. Um, and VEMP data, and I'll just show you the caloric today, but what we saw was that the proportion of children with abnormal horizontal canal function was significantly higher. And again, a lot of this had been de uh, um, 
obtain pre-implant or pre-sequential bilateral implant. So we were uh, understanding that it was secondary to the etiology of the deafness, not necessarily what we were doing as surgeons in putting in implants. And just like there was a higher prevalence of meningitis, there was also a higher prevalence of children with other etiologies known to be associated with vestibular impairment, Usher syndrome, for example. And so... Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, um, and so in terms of um, risk factors, you know, one of the things that we've come to learn is that not only is the implant bad for the vestibular system, but poor vestibular function is bad for the implant with the idea that children who have vestibular impairment will have a higher odds of implant failure um, by just under nine times. And so that's um, pretty significant um, with most of our, our non-device related failures, so non-recall related failures being in children with vestibular impairment prior to leaving our care at 18. So with that in mind, let's go back to thinking about how we build a brain and what the importance of auditory function and vestibular function is in terms of developing these higher order skills in terms of cognition and intellect. Because we know that vestibular impairment is bad for balance, um, but what else, you know, there's more to life than balance. Um, uh, and so let's talk about those other things. And so if we think about how children interact, they're not like you and you and I, like if we were together in a room, like right now, I have Dr. Ane's picture on my screen and I'm like giving her this lecture. Um, and, you know, and if we were together, we'd be looking in each other's eyes. You would be, you know, we would be face to face, but kids don't interact like that. Next time you're like in a park or with your kids, like I encourage you just to watch how they communicate because it's hilarious. Um, so like they're moving, they're talking, they're not looking at each each other, but they're having full on conversations. It's much more dynamic. And if we think of this little guy, um, you know, he's doing this puzzle, but he's listening, not in front of him, but behind him at what this little girl is singing. He's waiting to hear his name called over here. And so you know, this is why, again, you know, we think twice about directional microphones in these kids because they're not little adults when it comes to communication. And so that brings us to this concept of, you know, balance, navigation and spatial awareness, uh, because that is really something that's very important, both in the hearing loss domain and, and in the vestibular domain, as we think about what these kids need to develop knowledge of their spatial world. And so this is going to be a simplified schemata of how we acquire spatial knowledge. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going into that. And what we're going to focus on is um, three of our um, three of our senses, vision, hearing and vestibular function. Now, let's talk about vision. Um, and one of the things that we did, we had a collaboration with our ophthalmology department, um, and we went out and we measured a bunch of kids who had developmental visual anomalies, so strabismus and amblyopia. Um, and these are kids normal hearing and normal vestibular function. But look at their balance. It's crappy, eh? Like, it is not good at all. And so what we see is, and I've overlaid the data I've shown you before, this was all comers with hearing loss. And these are our kids with bilateral vestibular um, vestibular loss. And so these kids have normal uh, function in their ears, but their balance is still poor. And we think of that, you know, we should they should be able to overcome this. And the reason they can't is because these are developmental issues. So if we think about the trilogy of balance, it's vision proprioception and and um vestibular function we should put hearing in there too but that's a discussion for another day and we expect adults to remap right to re-weight but you can't re-weight if you never created the system and that's what's happening for these children and so let's talk about how we develop spatial knowledge if you've got hearing impairment. And so again, I'm going to show you a little video. This is a girl who's a competitive gymnast. She has bilateral hearing loss and wears bilateral implants. She's got normal vestibular function. Now look at her and we turned off one of her implants, okay? Mom would notice if a battery died. She had two different models of implants, um, like her externals. And she would notice that her performance would decrement if like one of them in practice went off. And so we change her 
hearing environment, we change the electrical milieu of her inner ear, and this leads to a decrement in balance. And so, again, she's got normal vision, normal vestibular function. And so it shows us that really we should be thinking about hearing. And so, again, you know, most um, of our studies follow from parental anecdote in a video. Um, so let me show you the study that we designed based on this anecdote. We wanted to look at the effects of poor spatial hearing. So we came up with three groups, typically binaural hearing kids, um, abnormally binaural hearing kids. So these are kids with simultaneous bilateral cochlear implants. So they've got access on both sides, but we know that those ears act independently. And a group of kids with untreated single-sided deafness, so older kids. And we had them do a million things. They were in the lab for like three hours and we had them do a number of you know, um, tasks related to spatial awareness, IQ, et cetera. And so this is what we found. And so in green, you've got our kids with bilateral cochlear implants um, and then our kids with unilateral hearing loss. And what you can see is that um, they both of those groups do much more poorly. And in some cases, even having one normal ear and one abnormal ear is worse than having two ears that are abnormal that require cochlear implants. And so it really showed us the importance of hearing um, when it comes to these tasks of spatial awareness. It also came out in terms of um, some of the early reading, again, a very visual spatial task. Um, and it's surprising, again, our kids with single-sided deafness really didn't perform nearly as well as we anticipated. Whether or not we make that better with implants is a whole other story. And so let's talk a little bit more about that. And it's probably not surprising for those of you, again, who know the literature on unilateral hearing loss. There's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that, you know, unilateral hearing loss is not good for the brain. And but we think there's more to the ear than just hearing. And so we also measured their balance. And so what we see, um, and I'm sorry, the, the, the lines were shifted on that graph I showed you of the vision. Um, I realize that now looking at this, but what we saw was that our kids with unilateral hearing loss had just as poor balance as those kids with bilateral hearing loss. And when we looked at their vestibular function, what we saw was that about 50% of them had at least a unilateral loss um, in horizontal canal and otolithic dysfunction. And so it's very prevalent for these kids to also have vestibular impairment. And perhaps that's part of their deficits when we look at that whole laundry list of literature supporting that. And so when we think about the consequences of unilateral hearing loss, perhaps we should broaden that and think about labyrinthine loss, particularly as we try and navigate this world of who sh we should put cochlear implants in for single-sided deafness and who not. Perhaps the child with unilateral labyrinthine loss is a better candidate than those with hearing loss alone. Uh, perhaps we have more capacity to change their spatial awareness, knowing that we're not giving them normal spatial awareness with a cochlear implant. So let's move now to what happens if you get the double whammy. You have hearing loss and vestibular loss, unlike the girl on the balance beam. And so let's talk about what that might look like. Um, and we talked about the idea that these kids have significant deficits in their balance function. And so... Um, Let's think about, you know, what that looks like in the real world. And I'll show you a video. This is our little guy with ushers who wants to try and learn to take that ski jump, right? And so let me play that for you again. Um, you know, not going to happen, right? He has no awareness of where his body is in space. Um, in Canada, we call that a yard sale when <laughs> the skis and everything go in different directions. And so we know that doing a lot of these things, these, you know, childhood tasks, riding a bike, learning to ski, learning to skate are going to be highly dependent on balance. And there's this dichotomy and you know I will travel places and people will be like I don't know what's wrong with your Canadian children but we don't see this in our clinic like our kids are fine um, and it makes sense that they say that to me because balance deficits are not always apparent you don't go to the ski hill and watch a child with hearing loss try and take a ski jump and and this is um, a young man who is in our program Damiano Panetta he swam for Canada in the Deaf Olympics um, and this is him in the pool okay um, and here he is he can't do what a five-year-old can do he can he can't stand on one foot with his eyes closed but like look at this guy like he is as, um, you know, 
amazing, right? You look at that and say, oh, this is a boy who nearly died of meningitis and has vestibular impairment, but watch as he comes. Look at this flip turn. And he just slowly deviates because for a moment, he loses his visual fixation on that black line on the bottom of the pool when he loses his orientation. And I look at this and I say, that's pretty darn good, right? Uh, but who am I to say? I'm not the kid in the pool, right? And he says to me, Dr. Cushing, I don't not only want to swim in the Deaf Olympics, I want to swim in the Olympics. And that flip turn cost me the milliseconds that's the difference in my mind. Can't you do something to fix my vestibular function? And so it was a good lesson for me that, again, we come with our own perspective, but these children are living their lives um, and they feel and live the deficits that these cause. So good enough for me is definitely not good enough for them. And that really, you know, pushes us forward in terms of trying to figure out novel ways to help them navigate the world. But this is why we miss it, because these kids run, they jump, they do all these amazing things. We do have an inordinate number of swimmers, competitive swimmers with vestibular impairment. So I think it's a particularly good sport for them because of all that beautiful proprioceptive information. Um, and so I think that that is... Um, that, you know, can be a super helpful practical tip that you can come home when these kids are struggling to find an activity they can excel at, suggest that they get in the pool. And so we wanted to look at this more. And so it can be really tricky to figure out, one, what's wrong and how to make them entirely better. And so we took a group of kids um, and um, we put them through, with cochlear vestibular loss, and we put them through um, this treadmill perturbation task. It's the subway task is, is what we call it. Because, you know, you can have them do dynamic tasks like the balance test I showed you, the bot, um, but real world perturbation is really where they struggle. And so this is what we we learned in this task. And so these they're labeled CI, um, but they're kids with CI and cochleovestibular function and control group. And so this is how they move in response to um, a movement, like an unexpected perturbation. And so right away you can see that they move a lot compared to what their colleagues do, what their um, counterparts do. And then what we did is we also looked at their working memory, right? Because you can only hold so much. Um, in at one mo at one moment and spending time deliberately thinking about balance is going to take things away. And so what we saw was that they demonstrated poorer working memory um, than our normal hearing, normal balancing controls. And when we think about how they um, prioritize tasks, it was interesting to us was that we assumed that they would prioritize balance over um, the actual task, but it was the opposite. So um, what they did is they sacrificed balance and probably physical safety in order to do the cognitive task. And so again, you can imagine as these kids navigate the world and high school, um, you know, going up steps and all of that, there's a lot of energy that's going out the door in terms of their physical navigation. So Let's get to the feel good part of the story, okay? Because we're just starting our days. Uh, and so how we how can we help? Well, the tool that we have most readily available to us is fixing their hearing, okay? Um, whether that be with hearing aids or cochlear implants or perhaps even gene therapy, should we dare to dream? Um, and so this is some old data that came from my master's thesis um, where we looked at the bot scores on and off for kids with bilateral dysfunction. Um, and this axis is cut, right? So we're starting at eight. So these differences are smaller than if we were starting at zero. But what we noticed was a consistent improvement if we provided these children with bilateral amplification. We decided to repeat that because um, that was sort of an, in the back of the clinic, um, like you saw in that first video of the two children with the red t-shirts. And we did it in the, um, we have access to this challenging environment lab um, over at our rehab institute. And so the kids get harnessed up and we can put all kinds of motion sensors on them. And then this is a platform. So we had them do the bot on that. We can also control the visual and the hearing surface around and get all of these um, cool measures. Probably too much data, in all honesty. That's the downside of fancy measures like this. But here is what we saw, um, was that, again, they had way less stability when it came to postural control. So uh, bigger is worse. Uh, and you can see this is very different than our children with typical hearing, typical balance. 
um, but that sound helped them. Um, and so this is um, a couple of the, one of the tasks done, eyes open, eyes closed. Um, and what you can see is that again, when we put the devices, um, the devices on, which is the blue, the, it, it gets smaller, they move less, which is good. Now, the auditory input didn't matter. So we actually had a uh, non-directional white noise, and then we had auditory sounds that were tied to the visual surround, the cars passing, the horns honking, things like that, and it didn't make a stitch of difference. Um, and so even just having background um, access to sound without any directional cues seemed to improve things. And we repeated our data from 2008 to see um, in a different group of kids. And again, in the majority of cases, with the exception of two, putting the implants on improved their, um, their balance. So let's think about how that's possible um, in children. And children with implants do all kinds of things that they, they shouldn't. And one of the ways they do that is plasticity. And so this is one of the ways we measure plasticity. This is a program that was designed by one of our PhD students. Um, and Because you can't put these kids in MEG scanners. And so this is 64 lead EEG. And it's processed in a way that is reminiscent of, um, of MEG scanning. So it's looking at what parts of the brain are doing something when we're having them do a task. And so this is an example of a study using this technology. And what we did is we did a listening task for kids, teenagers who were really experienced versus typically hearing kids. And what we did is we subtracted their brain activity using that um, using that uh, technology. And so all of these pixels that you see are all parts of the brain that the typical hearing individual does not use to listen. And so these are novel neural pathways um, that are designed um, by children who use cochlear implants in order to get the job done. Okay, so this is plasticity um, in pictorial form. Um, and there's other ways we can do that is also looking at effort. So you can look at reaction time, which is the classic one, but you can also look at pupil diameter, which is a great use for your VNG goggles. They can measure pupil diameter because sometimes kids get it right and they get it right in the same amount of time, but it still costs them more. Their gas tank ends up more empty with respect to their pupil diameter. And, and so we look at all of these things. And so if we think about our little boy that was skiing, you know, is it possible that he could put in enough effort to induce plasticity to land that ski jump? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes, because this is a feel good story. And so there he is, no vestibular system landing the ski jump. But if you ask his mom, what was the cost? of that. She will tell you he came home exhausted. He took that jump 120 times risking injury and grave her gray hair. He did not hang out with his friends. He did not do his homework. He did not make his bed that weekend. Um, and so that's the part is that, you know, the brain can do these amazing things. Um, we can perhaps drive that plasticity and certainly we can measure it, but it still comes at a cost. And so is there a way that we could give them better vestibular information? So I'll spend the last sort of five minutes talking, you know, about perhaps where we can go beyond just provision of hearing. And so early on, we wondered whether or not we could use some of the information from a cochlear implant for the vestibular system. Could we get electrical current, um, you know, was electrical current getting to the vestibular system? And so what we did is we measured um, both acoustically induced responses, these are VEMP responses coming from the otolithic system and electrically induced responses. And so no big deal, here you can do it acoustically and here you can do it electrically. And here we're just turning on the implant. So we're not playing a sound through the implant, we're actually just um, activating the electrodes. And what was amazing though, was that there were some individuals who had loss of their acoustic signal, either because I'd been in there with an implant or because of the etiology of their deafness. And in those kids, we could restore their electrical stimulation, their, their responsiveness with electrical stimulation. Sounds familiar, right? It's what we do with hearing. Um, and so we wondered about, can we push that system harder um, to eke out as much benefit for these children? And so again, we went to looking at behavioral measures in terms of looking at perception of verticality, because while having a VEMP may or may not help that kid with the ski jump, having a better perception of verticality certainly would. And so 
When we measure vertical perception of verticality, we use the SVV, and this is how we do it. We sort of low tech, high tech. So there's an iPod um, or an iPhone at the bottom of this in a bucket, and um, there's an app called the Subjective Visual Vertical that's been um, standardized in children um, by Jake Brodsky um, at Boston, um, and we use this test all the time in our clinic. And so this is what we found. So let me take you through this graph. If you have an abnormal perception of verticality, you either lean left or you lean right. And so what we found is that when we turned the devices, the cochlear implants on, the left leaners shifted right and the right leaners shifted left. So it corrected their perception of verticality. Um, and certainly we would expect that to help our little guy with the ski jump. And so... In summary, it's I know it's been a little bit of a whirlwind, but certainly I hope that I've left you with these messages that vestibular imbalance deficits are common and they have huge impacts on performance and development. Hearing is way more important to balance than we've ever given it credit for. And there's lots that we can do in terms of providing children with bilateral probably not binaural, we're not there yet, um, access to sound with cochlear implants and with hearing aids. And this comes with some technologic limits and also some compensatory limits because it does require an amount of effort. Outcomes are complicated and certainly when I read papers about the outcomes of CI or hearing amplification, I always wonder, well, what's happening? You know, is some of that variability accounted for by um, a lack of measuring vestibular function in these kids? And certainly it extends much beyond balance and looks at a lot of the different developmental and learning um, pathways that we see. And there's many gaps in knowledge that exist, which is exciting because it leaves us with things to do um, and things that inspire us, especially as we move on to new treatments. So I'm going to leave you um, with one last slide. You remember our kid with Usher syndrome, right? And I said he'd never get up on a, on a surfboard. Well, what better motivation is there for a young boy than to do what his dad does? right? And his dad is from the Dominican and his dad surfs. And so this kid was going to get up on a surfboard. There he is with his dad getting up and not falling off despite not having a vestibular system. And it's a reminder to us that as humans, you know, we are going to have challenges, but we are designed not to break. And what a joy it is to be involved with children um, as clinicians, as cheerleaders, um, as they go on to sort of overcome these things um, be because of their motivation. So it is uh, a joy that we have to do that. And I will finish. This is my email. You can always reach out um, if there's something that, uh, that I can help you with. Thanks very much. I see Dr. Ane's got her hand up. <laughs> You knew I would. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. As always, like such a pleasure to hear the talk. And um, I always walk away like amazed at the work you do. A um, couple of quick things. I just wanted to give props to Evie. She was actually the one that tapped you for the grand rounds and um, wanted to you know, give her props for picking such an amazing speaker. A um, couple of questions slash comments. Um, one, you know, when you have these anomalous cochlea and they all are like I have this patient infant that has a genetic disorder that causes motor delay. Yeah. And then she has anomalous cochlea and she's a candidate for bilateral CI. What do you tell this family in terms of, like, you know, they're gonna have vestibular function hits mm -hmm. on top of their potential motor delay? And the parents will ask me, like, well, how, how long do you think it'll take for her to walk? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, so that was one question. And the second question I had was, you know, your um, vestibular here. function kind of predicting almost like CI failure. What um, CI failure are you um, talking about? Is it like a soft failure or is it an actual device failure? Like, um, yeah, those are, those are my two questions. 
Yeah. So the first one is tricky and it's a question that comes up a lot. And kids, the first thing I'll say is that kids are different than adults in terms of we never use vestibular function as a driver to decide what we're going to do with our cochlear implants. Whereas I think that's a little bit different in the adult world. Um, and so, you know, what I would say to the families is when when motor impairment or failure to walk is related to vestibular impairment alone, most kids will do so between 18 and 24 months. If it's taking longer than 24 months, it's vestibular impairment plus, right? Um, so kids that have other sort of neurologic motor delay issues, um, I would wholeheartedly go and put implants in because that child might be walking into the operating room with poor function already. So it's it's even feasible that you're not actually at risk of making it worse because it may already be gone. Um, and the truth is, is that even if it was perfect and you got it on both sides, which the risk of that happening is less than 2%. Um, if you look at sort of theoretical modeling, um, and that's based on old techniques, old electrodes, um, you know, they will, the provision of sound is going to help them way more because right now we don't have a vestibular implant, um, but we do have cochlear implants. And so that's sort of where as much as I love the vestibular system under the bus, it goes when it comes to providing cochlear implants. In terms of the second one, um, it, these were device failures, so not failure of the implant to provide spoken language or that kind of thing. We went back to all of sort of the autopsy reports of these, and I learned a lot actually about how that happens because I had a lot of questions for the company. And just like any autopsy, like it, it is not... Um, it is not uh, all encompassing. And so you, you know, there were times where it, there was like clearly something broken. Um, and then there were other times where they didn't identify anything, but I came to learn from those conversations that there was a lot that they don't necessarily check for. Um, and so it could have been, you know, our thought is that it's secondary either to a blow or multiple micro traumas. Like even how these kids put their heads on the pillow, right? Um, again, they have no sense of where they are in space and so that was our theory that makes sense thank you and in con you know when you turn the implant on you're suggesting that it could improve the vestibular function so in these bilateral vestibular hypofunction kids theoretically you could potentially help them yeah yeah and so i think there's two parts to it given them hearing bilaterally um not binaurally is like if we could do it binaurally whoo the sky's the limit. And hopefully there's a, a time in our careers where we see that. Um, but I think there's also the question of what does that baseline current, even if it's not modulated by movement, what does that do for, you know, a system that likes to have a little current at baseline? I think, Mark, you had your hand up next. Yes. Sharon, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, I've always respected your work, uh, but when you called nystagmus gorgeous, you just took it to a different level. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I have a quite a few questions. Actually, I'm, I'm mostly on the adult side right now, but um, the, the question always comes up for vest pediatric vestibular testing is where are we with the normative data? What's considered normal and what's not, you know, in the, in the routine tests that we use. And I think you've showed some of the other tests. Um, the other question I have is also on the adult side, a lot of times what's, we find in those tests in terms of vestibular deficits do not correlate with what the patients report. And maybe it's the reporting tools that we're using, the questionnaires that we're using, uh, and definitely things are different in adults who have already developed the vestibular function. Uh, but I'd be curious to hear your uh, thoughts on this. And the third part of my question is, you know, you talked about electric stimulation improving uh, vestibular balance. Are we, you know, any thoughts on the vestibular implant or the cochlear vestibular implant that we're, you know, hearing more and more about right now? Absolutely. So I think I've forgotten the first question already. Oh, my goodness. Normative oh. data. Oh, normative, normative data. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was getting more and more excited about your question, so <laughs> it cleared my cash. Um, so normative data is is tricky. Again, you know, in an ideal world, you will um, produce your own normative data in your lab. That being said, I think there's some pretty good normative data out there. Um, you know, the difference between um, certainly in our lab, 
we use big gradations, absent, present, right? Um, you know, we do use cutoffs for um, both, you know, our caloric testing and our um, VHIT testing that are consistent with adult norms. Um, but again, we're not, again, I'm very cautious when I see a small abnormality. We do not use at this moment in time differences in amplitude and that kind of thing. So we're looking for the big things, which I think sort of um, reduces the need to be so um, particular about normative data, but ideally, again, you produce your own um, on your test equipment. And that leads into your second question is that we recently uh, looked, it's just about to be submitted for publication um, at our group of kids with hearing loss. And then the group of kids that I see in my Dizzy Clinic, which are two very separate groups of kids. Um, and in the kids with that present with Dizzy Clinics, they often have mild, niggly, unilateral abnormalities. And I'm not sure what to make of those. And, you know, we sort of think of this, you know, there is false positivity to our tests and false negativity to our tests. And looking at that data really made me, you know, cautious about sort of the mild unilateral abnormality um, and that being related to test um, issues. Um, and that's where I feel like if the clinical picture doesn't match the data, um, then there's you know, the clinical picture always in many ways holds true. There's also a whole bunch of other things that affect your balance that aren't related to your vestibular system, particularly when you get into the adult world. Um, from that perspective, we see it in our kids who present with functional neurologic disorders, and we see a ton of those. Those kids have terrible balance, but normal vestibular function, not surprisingly. And then the last question was, oh gosh, Cochlear vestibular. Disorder. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. The most exciting one. Um, and so, you know, there was a time where we were looking at, we had a, a prototype where we were actually trying to modulate the current based on head position. You know, unfortunately, we need the company's help with that because we can't get under the hood of the implant to do that. Um, and there was some initial, you know, benefit to that. Unfortunately, the company decided it was no longer um, what they wanted to study. And sadly, like, threw like a big pot of water on the fire, sadly. Um, and we kind of can't do it without them. Um, from that perspective, I hope that it comes back um, to some degree. There are a number of groups that are doing beautiful work looking at vestibular implants. Um, but I think, and I think there's potential there. But like, the fact that we're not there yet doesn't mean it's never going to work, but that it, it's finicky, right? It's, you know, cochlear implants, you know, were like a shot in the dark and we've been trying to catch up figuring out how they work ever since, but we haven't had that same impact with vestibular implants. So I probably have a little bit more hope perhaps for some of the gene therapies being helpful to both parts than I might for um, the very small population of individuals who might benefit from a cochlear vestibular implant. Interesting. Evie? Hi, Dr. Cushing. Um, nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting. You're such a good speaker. And with this topic, I could really just listen to you talk all day. I love it. Um, but I did have one question. So with the data you presented looking at cochlear implant reimplantation and um, kiddos with vestibular loss at sick kids, are you guys doing like a pre um, vestibular testing for all kiddos or is it based off severity of hearing loss or etiology or do you not really or is it only with symptoms or what does that look like? Yeah, it it is um, not perfect um, and a work in progress. It is my dream that again we get reliable data on every baby um, before we put implants in and we you know bring them back for testing until we get that reliable data. Um, that being said, that's not where we're at in terms of a you know from a you know, man and woman power issue um, and, and that. So we do try and test our babies before we get in and we're, you know, we're testing down to six months of age. Um, that being said, it um, it is tricky um, to do that. So etiology does come into it and it's sort of where you're like we start somewhere and then keep going. We also do testing at our adult center for kids that are older than five or six. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Cushing. I think um, unless somebody else has questions, it's perfect timing, 801.
Uh, that was an amazing talk. I learned a lot of any hearing or vestibular or pediatric, but I really learned a lot. And, you know, thank you so much for your expertise and your guidance. Excellent. It was Thanks, lovely Sherry. to spend the morning with you guys. And I'm not far away if you ever need anything. I'll see you soon, Sam. Bye, Sharon. Bye.